Hello, young soul. Welcome to the Daily Horror Channel. If you are afraid of real and scary reports, this channel is not for you. I suggest you leave this video. But if you are not afraid of listening to these horrifying reports, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next stories. On a quiet street with the rain drizzling down, a peculiar little shop suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Or so it seemed. Some folks claimed it had been there for ages, just hidden in plain sight while others were convinced it materialized overnight like magic. The storefront was plain to the point of invisibility, with dusty windows that barely let you peek inside, and a flickering sign that read, Wish Emporium, in faded letters accompanied by a bizarre symbol resembling a cross between a star and a swirling vortex beckoning you to enter i jake was never one to get swept up in such nonsense life had me tied up in knots my vintage shop barely scraped by month after month i was fighting to keep it afloat holding on for dear life and on that fateful day when i left the bank empty-handed after being denied a loan all i wanted was to vanish that's when i caught sight of the emporium the sign swayed in the breeze, and for reasons I couldn't explain, it felt like the place was calling me. My curiosity got the better of me, and before I knew it I was stepping inside. The interior was something out of a surreal dream. Dimming lights cast a yellowish glow, flickering like the place had its own heartbeat. The shelves overflowed with oddities that felt like they crawled straight out of a horror flick. Frozen clocks, warped mirrors, creepy statues that seemed to stare at you, and, strangest of all, an old gramophone playing hauntingly soft tunes, as if from another era. The air was thick with the musty scent of damp wood mingled with a sickly sweet perfume that could give anyone a headache. Every nook and cranny seemed unsettlingly peculiar, like everything in that shop was intentionally out of place. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, convinced that some shadows shifted in the corners when I wasn't looking. Behind the counter, a man lounged in a tattered suit, his broad-brimmed hat casting a shadow over his face. He exuded a chilling calm, almost inviting, but his eyes betrayed a darkness that sent shivers down my spine. They were too deep, hiding something sinister. Afternoon, he stated, flashing a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes, looking for something unique. My first instinct was to bolt, but curiosity had me rooted to the spot. Just looking, I muttered, half in a daze. He moved with an unearthly grace, picking at trinkets on the counter as he spoke, words rolling off his tongue like a well-practiced script. My emporium has treasures for every type of soul, wants, needs, even desires you're not aware you have. A nervous chuckle escaped my lips as I began to rummage through the shelves, and then it hit me. Each object seemed to whisper its own story, old photographs of strangers, all wearing expressions of sorrow, gripping items now for sale like remnants of their old lives, it sank in. These relics had traveled through time, each bearing a haunting tale. You seem like someone searching for change, he intoned, voice dropping as if sharing a clandestine secret. A way out. His words struck a nerve. It felt as if he had picked the very thoughts from my mind. Pulling a small wooden box from the counter, he slid it toward me. It was simple, yet it bore the same strange symbol from the sign. This, he proclaimed, is one of my prized possessions. Don't be deceived by its appearance. It holds everything you crave. Skeptical, I peered at him, my instincts screaming that this was a joke. Yet something about his tone sparked intrigue. Curiosity triumphed, and I lifted the lid inside lay a single folded sheet of paper. Write down your wish. Anything, he suggested, grinning ever so slightly. It requires just a minor payment. With nerves bubbling within, I grabbed the paper. In that moment, it felt like a game I scrawled my wish. Prosperity for my shop, the ability to recover and thrive. To turn the tides, I sealed the paper and placed it back in the box. His eyes bore into mine, a knowing look lingering as he remarked, Done. But remember... Every wish carries a price. After paying for the box, 
I stumbled back outside, still reeling from the experience days past. And gradually, my shop turned into a bustling hub. Customers flooded in as if summoned by some unseen force. They clamored for my most expensive pieces, and soon enough, everything was flying off the shelves. I couldn't believe my sudden turnaround. It was as if I was basking in newfound luck. But as the euphoria wore off, eerie occurrences began to unfold. Items I thought had sold seemed to reappear unexpectedly, as though trapped in a time loop. Mirrors reflected shadows distinctly, not my own. I heard whispers, disembodied voices calling out a name I couldn't quite catch. Mine. One day, while straightening up, the little box I'd purchased reappeared right on my counter, despite my certainty that I'd secured it at home. When I opened it, the paper was smeared with ominous red spots, like dried blood. Just then, my phone buzzed. My sister's tear-filled voice came through, frantically informing me that my dad had been involved in a serious accident. I rushed to the hospital, but a sinking feeling twisted my gut. It dawned upon me that every bit of success in my shop seemed to come at the expense of a loved one suffering. My father survived, but his condition was grave. Then my mother fell ill, and finally a close friend had an accident as well. It became impossible to ignore. Each victory of mine echoed the anguish of others. Though my shop flourished, my personal world crumbled. Friends distanced themselves, family members battled illness, and that unnerving presence lurking behind me intensified. The haunted box followed me, reappearing unpredictably, always with the blood-stained letter inside one night. Jolted awake by a noise, I dashed to the shop. It was a chaotic mess of fallen items and shattered mirrors, shadows seemingly writhing in a life of their own. When I flicked the light, there he was, the hat-wearing man grinning in the corner like he'd been waiting for me. Did you enjoy what you wished for? He taunted. What have you done? I shouted, fear lacing my voice. He chuckled softly, gesturing towards a mirror that showed a mirror image of myself surrounded by everyone impacted by my desires. Their faces were contorted in grief and blame. The cost is always paid, he echoed, his voice reverberating unnaturally within the walls. The lights flickered and just like that he vanished, leaving the empty box wide open at the center of the room as if waiting for yet another wish. I realized then that escape was but a fantasy. The shop was a binding force in my life and every desire birthed new debts. The shadows were unyielding in their persistence. That night ignited an uncontrollable vortex, spiraling me towards chaos. Each day appeared to deliver fresh nightmares, and the vintage store transformed into a frenzied aisles of customers who moved like soulless husks, driven by some unseen compulsion. The damned box kept reappearing. I flung it in the trash, torched it, locked it away, yet it returned, always conspicuously open with its blood-soaked letter. The shadows in the Emporium were alive, moving of their own accord. Occasionally, a customer's gaze would track a shadow from an impossible corner, sending a chill racing down my spine. Home wasn't an escape either. Restless nights plagued me with whispers of urgency. The walls turned icy, and the clock inched to midnight, eternally stuck. It felt like time itself conspired to trap me. One day, amidst sorting new arrivals in the shop, my heart plummeted. An old mirror faced the corner, covered in smudges. In its reflection, instead of my shop, I saw a dimly lit street filled with eerie figures dressed in outdated clothing. One man, who seemed to be the same one who sold me the cursed box, locked eyes with me through the cracked mirror. Backing away in fright, the vision vanished, leaving only my startled reflection. Footsteps echoed behind me seemingly from another presence, but turned to find nothing. The lights flickered and the radio, previously muted, crackled alive with haunting melodies. The same tune echoing from the Wish Emporium the day I first visited. The haze of the shadows thickened, my chest tightening under a weight I couldn't bear. Desperate, I dialed my only friend, Sam, who had been silent for too long. His wearied voice mixed with annoyance answered, What's up? You disappeared. Everyone's buzzing about you and what's going on. I unloaded everything, the shop, 
the eerie occurrences, the connected tragedies, which only left him speechless on the line. You need to come over, I pleaded. I don't know what to do. After a moment of hesitation, he agreed. When Sam arrived, the chill in the air was profound. Instinctively, he sensed the shift. The shadows appeared more ominous, and his discomfort was palpable. I explained everything, growing more anxious as he displayed bewilderment. He finally proposed we destroy that doing damned box once and for all. We headed to the back, where a metal barrel stood for burning debris. Sam struck a match and tossed it towards the box. Yet, it wouldn't catch fire, as if the wood were laced with something that thwarted flames. After several tries, we finally saw flames alight, darkness swirling as dense foul smoke erupted at once. The Emporium rattled furiously, objects clattered and fell, and shadows surged towards us like an angry tide. A mirror shattered with a deafening crash, revealing that unsettling street once more, filled with familiar faces drifting toward the dreaded Emporium door. Let's get out of here, Sam yelled, panic driving his voice. Before we could escape, dark smoke consumed the space, aided by the relentless melody now blaring, urgent and frantic. The shadows coalesced, transforming into spectral figures, those I'd wronged before captivating eyes hollow with helplessness. They beckoned for aid while stretching hands towards me, but devoid of hope. Suddenly enveloped, I felt myself yanked away into nothingness, unanchored in a vacuum where time and reality ceased to exist. Amidst the chaos, I glimpsed Sam fighting against the dark tide, but he faded just like that. I hit the ground hard, disoriented. When I gathered myself, the Emporium was empty, devoid of life. No shelves, no antiques, and the enigmatic man was absent. Only an absolute void remained. Stumbling outside, I found myself back in my quaint antique shop, still just as I'd left it. The cursed box had vanished, and for the first time in weeks, the weight of shadows lifted. Relief flooded through me. Yet I understood that this wasn't simply over. The Wish Emporium wasn't just a building. It was a dark concept. A curse that would linger in existence as long as souls yearned for desires they couldn't afford. In my heart, I realized this cycle would never end. Someone else would surely stumble upon the store, just like I did. Days later, as I locked up my shop, a flicker of movement caught my eyes. A tattered flyer lay strewn on the sidewalk, the cursed symbol clearly etched onto it. I glanced around. The street stood deserted. Trembling, I snatched it, reading its content. Open for business, the Wish Emporium awaits you. A bitter laugh escaped my lips, a sound laced with acceptance that escape was impossible. The shop would never close, forever reaching out for souls willing to pay the price. The echo of a distant bell rang through, and in that moment I understood. It was back, perhaps around the corner, in another town. But it was always there, lying in wait. For the Wish Emporium never truly fades. It merely relocates. One chilly evening, I found myself alone in my office, surrounded by a mess of paperwork scattered everywhere, on my desk and on the floor. The case I was handling felt monumental, a gargantuan maze filled with legal loopholes I couldn't seem to navigate. My mind raced with the thought that if I triumphed, my career would finally take off. No longer would I be the mediocre attorney nobody respected. I could become a name to reckon with, but the stress was suffocating, and with each turn of the page I felt increasingly adrift. Amidst the chaos of legal textbooks and aged files, I stumbled upon something that would alter my fate entirely. Buried beneath a stack of dusty documents on the shelf lay an ancient tome, ragged and forgotten, its cover cracked and devoid of any title. It felt oddly alive in my grasp, heavy with secrets. Curiosity peaked, 
I pried it open, releasing a scent of aged paper mingled with something metallic. Was that blood? The pages were filled with contracts, nothing like the standard legal jargon I was used to. The handwriting was archaic, almost a work of art I fixated on one document in particular. It had my name, slightly smeared yet unmistakably clear. Tony Reed. I chuckled nervously, dismissing it as a mere coincidence or a practical joke. Yet as I read on, the content was disturbingly precise. The contract promised victories in legal battles and instant recognition, with a curious clause stating, a favor in exchange for another. It was absurd, and I momentarily contemplated tossing the book in the trash, but my intrigue overpowered my skepticism. There was no talk of souls or curses, but one detail stood out. To seal the deal, a drop of blood is required for the signature. I laughed at the ridiculousness of it, like something from a terrible horror flick. Yet desperation clouded my judgment and I was feeling reckless. Finding a paperclip, I unfolded it and pricked my finger without thinking twice. A droplet of blood fell onto the page, anchoring itself in the signature line. The blood seeped into the document as if the paper were thirsty for it. I inscribed my name beneath it, and an odd tremor rippled through the book. Chills ran down my spine, yet I dismissed my apprehension with laughter snapping the book shut and placing it back on the shelf as if to erase my actions from memory. In the days that followed, everything shifted. I won the case, remarkably, almost too effortlessly. Each loophole I exploited, every argument I presented, fell flawlessly into place. It felt like I was directing a well-executed play. Suddenly, I was the star of the show at the firm, with accolades pouring in. My phone buzzed incessantly with new clients, and before long, articles hailed me as the rising star of the legal scene. But with success came the onset of eerie occurrences. One night, while engrossed in another case file at the office, an icy blast of air swept through as if every window had flung open simultaneously. I glanced around, yet everything was sealed tight. The blinds swayed gently, and the rustling of pages whispered incomprehensible words that floated on the air. I tried to shake off the odd sensation that someone loomed just behind me, watching my every move. When I glanced at my reflection in the window, for a heartbeat, I glimpsed a shadow that didn't match my own. I rationalized it as fatigue. But then, peculiar incidents began to unfold. The lights flickered, the phone rang repeatedly. Yet, when I picked up, there was only silence. One evening while returning home, I noticed a silhouette trailing me. A tall figure draped in a dark coat, their face obscured by a wide-brimmed hat. With every corner I turned, he mirrored my movements. Gathering my courage to confront him, I turned around, yet he vanished, leaving behind a lingering scent of sulfur. My night soon morphed into a nightmarish ordeal. I woke in the dead of night, drenched in sweat, convinced I was being watched. Shadows danced in my room, spurring my imagination while whispers echoed in the dark, calling my name in a soft, eerie tone as if someone stood right beside me. I shared my fears with my spouse, but she dismissed them as stress and fatigue. Deep down, I wanted to believe her, but the situation escalated. One night, an enormous crash jolted me awake in my home office. I crept down the stairs, trying to be quiet, only to find chaos. Books and papers were strewn all over as if a whirlwind had swept through. In the center of the disorder, the old book lay wide open, the pages fluttering as if caught in an unseen breeze, revealing a new contract. This time, my name was boldly written, and the blood that once dripped had now formed an intricate trace covering the entire page. The temperature in the room plummeted, freezing me in my spot. A powerful wind blasted through the sealed window, causing the book to rattle. It landed on a particular clause, the words ringing ominously. The cost of each victory shall be paid with that which is most precious. Then, in the window's reflection, there it was, the figure with crimson eyes and a wicked grin, staring directly at me. The shadow I had seen before, now vivid and unsettling, stood there with a resigned satisfaction. I dashed to awaken my wife, only to find her missing. 
The bedsheets were disheveled, as if she had bolted from bed abruptly. My frantic search across the house yielded nothing. Calling her cell, I was met with the same soft whisper, this time louder, hollowly repeating, Tony, Tony, Tony. Desperation morphed into panic, driving me into the night, racing down the streets with no destination. Every corner felt darker, reality distorting like some never-ending nightmare. The next morning, I returned to the office to find no trace of the uproar, except for that same book lying open on my desk. A new line had been scrawled alongside the others. The next payment will be the final one. I was ensnared. Each triumph I had achieved came with a cost I never agreed to pay, laying bare the truth of my situation. I had no way to escape this contract. The lights flickered violently, and in the faint glow of my computer screen, I watched as the figure advanced towards me, inching closer with an unsettling allure. Panic coursing through my veins, I attempted to rise to make my escape, but tendrils of shadow wrapped around me. His gravelly whisper filled my ears, foreshadowing a choice that would shatter all sense of reason, binding me to an agreement far beyond any legal consequences. The blood contract I had foolishly signed turned out to be not just ink on paper. It was a vow I was never meant to forge. The office lay draped in stifling darkness, with flickering lights casting eerie shapes that seemed to breathe. The figure I had glimpsed before loomed ever closer, his eyes aglow amidst the shadows. Every step he took echoed within my mind, alongside the ominous rustling of the book, its pages flipping soundlessly as if counting down to a veritable reckoning. I tried to distance myself from my desk, the cold sweat pooling on my back, my legs trembling under the weight of dread as shadows gnawed at my ankles, creeping upward like a relentless tide. Shouting felt futile, my voice swallowed by the thick air that pulsated with menace. Suddenly the walls of the office began to distort, stretching as if they were made of elastic, and disembodied voices filled the air. You asked for this. You signed. The cacophony of whispers surrounded me, each voice distinct yet overlapping, mixing mockery with despair. The red-eyed figure approached, his smile growing grotesque, revealing sharp teeth that glinted under the dim light. He extended his hand, clutching a fresh contract inscribed with a handwriting that appeared to drip with an unsettling fluidity. The title was unmistakable. The Final Promise. Deep within me I recognized that signing it would break the final seal. But what alternative did I have? My choices led me here, and now I face the ramifications. Those eyes, expressing more than words ever could, bore into my soul. A dark aura swirled around him, undulating like a living entity. The book on my desk opened by itself, its pages fluttering rapidly, unveiling names, dates, broken promises, and sacrifices already made. Familiar faces stared back at me, clients, colleagues, trapped within contracts that had never been meant to come to life. It felt as though their souls were shackled, each signature tying them to this wretched fate. I attempted to rise but found my body betrayed me, glued to the chair as if it had become part of me. The sound of metal scraping clawed through the air, and when I turned my head, the old wall clock that had once been a reliable fixture was now exposed, gears spinning chaotically. Time played tricks, seconds morphing into endless moments while the hands whirled backward, counting down the hours I had wasted. The figure with the crimson gaze leaned in, his face an inch from mine, suffusing the space with frosty air that stole the warmth from my body. Though he was silent, his intentions were explicit, ingrained in the pulsating words of the contract I could conquer every case, rule the world of law, but the price would escalate until nothing of me remained. At that instant, the office morphed again, walls constricting and compressing, a sinister trap closing in. I was transported back to a haunting chamber, lit only by shadows that carried whispered secrets. Evan stood before me, that self-satisfied grin plastered across his face, flanked by faceless silhouettes gliding rhythmically like a parade of lost souls. The book snapped shut with a finality, and the man proffered a pen, forged from a chill metal that burned upon touching. The contract lay before me, his name curiously awaiting my signature. 
The gravity of what signing would entail loomed over me like a dark cloud. I understood that what had transpired so far would pale in comparison to what lay ahead. Yet, the terror of being ensnared with those hollow stairs pressed me to grasp at what felt like my only option. Trembling, I signed my name. The paper absorbed the ink with an unsettling gleam, and the room trembled as if awakened. The shadowy figures encroached, their hands reaching out, brushing my skin. Each touch a sensation of emptiness spreading through my being. I felt as if I were draining away, and when I raised my gaze, the crimson-eyed figure faded from view, leaving only the contract behind. The darkness receded, and suddenly the office reverted to normalcy. The lights steadied, the clock ticked calmly, but everything was shifted now. The book had vanished, yet the contract remained. My name inscribed an intricate script, a permanent marker of my entrapment within an inescapable loop. Stumbling out of the office, my mind felt scrambled. Each step against the pavement, an effort to resist being drawn back and home welcomed me with an eerie quiet. My wife was still missing, and outside, darkness loomed beyond the windows. No sleep was restful. Whenever I closed my eyes, the contract resurfaced along with the figure of the man with crimson eyes, his ghost forever haunting my thoughts. Weeks slithered by. Victories washed over me like a wave, but morphed into vivid nightmares. With every case I secured, a piece of me slipped away unnoticed. My health dwindled inexplicably. I withered, lost my appetite, while the nights stretched endlessly, surrounded by shadows that whispered malevolently. My wife's absence felt like a void no one could fill, and calls to friends brought only unsettling silence. It was as if I was being methodically erased from their lives. The office grew a sinister aura. My once close colleagues now avoided me like a plague. I would catch them whispering furtively, glancing away as if I were a ghost. One fateful night, while laboring alone, I heard a tearing noise echoing through the stillness. Turning to my desk, I saw the contract I had signed disintegrating before my eyes, as though consumed by an unseeable fire. Yet the words remained rising into the air and rearranging themselves into new clauses I had never encountered. The whispers intensified, becoming a cacophony within my mind. Shadows with void-like eyes, once seen only in peripheral glances around my office, began invading every section of my life. Reflections in mirrors, window panes, even the glass of my car. One afternoon while driving home, a sudden glance at my rear view met the gaze of the red-eyed man seated in the back grinning serenely as if he had always been there. I screeched to the side of the road, panic swelling in my chest. But by the time I turned around, the back seat was empty. It was then I resolved to end this madness once and for all. One bleary night, I returned to the office, my mind set on reclaiming the book that had long since vanished. I scoured drawers, shelves, every crevice as a chill gripped the air, thickening as if the very room were alive, watching my every move. My heart raced as, at last, hidden under a stack of forgotten paperwork, I unearthed the aged book. It appeared older and more tainted than before. When I cracked it open, a blank page unfolded, revealing a singular straightforward command. Undo what has been done. But how could one retract a blood oath? I glanced around and there he was, the shadowy figure with eyes aflame, looming in the corner, featureless yet magnetic words started materializing on that blank page as if inscribed by an invisible hand. Undo with sacrifice. As if responding to his command, the office trembled and the shadow twisted, reshaping into a distorted semblance of a man emerging from the wall. My reflection, older, with vacant eyes and a haggard visage, it drew closer, a chilling reminder of the debt I had yet to settle. The contract materialized once again on the table, the cold pen resting beside it, demanding to be held. I realized then that a greater sacrifice was required to break this curse. Looking at my aged reflection, the figure smiled, a sinister offer that held the key to my liberation, albeit at an ultimate cost. With determination, I took that pen and scratched through my own name, the ink spilling like blood, the lines crossed fiercely, aiming to erase every trace of my identity. The paper began to dissolve, burning but without flames, 
Slowly vanishing into nothingness, the figure across from me started to fade too, his crimson eyes dimming into hollowness, the office disintegrated, swallowed by vast shadows. I awoke on the office floor, alone and desolate. The contract, the book, everything had vanished. The lights glowed steadily and the clock struck midnight as if the tumult had never occurred. I staggered out into the quiet street, feeling the brisk air on my face, sweet relief washing over me for the first time in ages. Yet upon arriving home I found the door ajar. Cautiously I stepped inside, my heart pounding, to see my wife sitting innocently at the kitchen table, as if nothing had transpired. She beamed at me but there was something in her eyes I couldn't quite latch onto. I inquired where she had been but she merely laughed, claiming she'd been here the whole time, waiting for me. In that instant, intuition prickled at me. Something was amiss, but my heart swelled at her presence, blinding me to the foreboding. As we embraced, a shadow flickered at the edge of the room, sliding almost unnoticed, but it was undeniable. The same red-eyed figure, now a specter on the glass, smirked at me. He hadn't departed. He never would. The debt I had cleared was merely the tip of the iceberg, and the sense of freedom I misbelieved in was just further deception. For now, he lingered in my home, within my existence. As I caught a glimpse of his reflection, a chill crept over me. I realized that my own eyes began to mirror his, alive with the same crimson glow. In the depths of the wild pine grove, there's a treehouse whispered about among the locals, a structure that was never meant to be discovered. This eerie tale has been shared for generations, filled with eerie details and warnings that the residents dismissed as mere folklore. Stories of kids vanishing after playing near it emerged, said to be lured away by a sinister pact, a bargain that should have never been struck. But, as fate would have it with legends, curiosity triumphed over fear. And that's how my crew and I, just a bunch of bored teens, found ourselves drawn into that story I remember those days clearly. Pine Grove was a small town where everyone knew each other, and there was hardly anything exciting happening. Not unless you counted the occasional new burger joint or the latest gossip from the local market. My friends and I, Nick, Mia, and Jake, were constant companions in this monotony. Always on the lookout for something to break the cycle, we finally decided to venture into the woods one sweltering afternoon. The heat was stifling, and with every step through the humid air, it felt as if the forest was trying to swaddle us in its embrace. Are you guys scared of some kid's tail? Mia teased, chuckling as she tossed her hair into a messy bun. Jake and I exchanged glances, pretending the legend didn't faze us. Deep down, however, we both recognized the potential danger hidden within the story. After what felt like ages wandering those tangled paths, we finally spotted it. A crumbling structure wedged between the towering trees. It was decrepit, resembling a skeletal frame of wood that had long been forgotten. A lone swing creaked ominously as it swayed in the gentle breeze, as if beckoning us closer. An unsettling vibe lingered in the air. The silence was almost deafening, interrupted only by the rustle of leaves as they danced with the wind. Walking up the rickety stairs, unease crept over me. I felt like we were intruding on a space that was off limits inside. Everything was frozen in time. The floor was coated in dry leaves, while scattered dusty toys hinted at a hurried exit by past residents. Strange symbols adorned the walls, painted in an unnatural hue that seemed to pulse with life. In the center stood a tattered table, littered with old papers and burnt out candles. Mia, being the boldest among us, was the first to touch anything, her fingers skimming across a dilapidated notebook that lay open. The sketches inside were grotesque, images of children upside down and lurking shadows, as if they were peering through cracks in reality. 
Check this out, she said, holding up one of the drawings. Look at this kid, he's got a creepy grin, and below him it reads, The price is fair. Jake, who had been silent until then, began to rummage through the drawers of a nearby cabinet. He unearthed a doll missing its eyes, filthy, with a rusty stain smeared across its face. He recoiled, dropping it back as if it had burned him. The atmosphere grew thicker, palpable with an unease that settled in our stomachs. The longer we stayed, the more uncomfortable we felt. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps outside, a sound that sent our hearts racing. We fell silent, eyes glued to the door, half expecting something to burst through. But when the door creaked open, it was merely empty air, save for the inconsistency of the swing, now moving wildly as though disturbed by an unseen force. Mia forced a laugh, saying it was just the wind, but I could see in her eyes that she didn't quite believe that either. Things took a turn when we noticed the stuff around us was shifting. The notebook Mia had placed back on the table was now on the floor, open to a page with a circle surrounded by figures, almost like a ritual candles that had been extinguished flickered to life, casting an eerie glow that highlighted the grinning faces etched into the walls. The temperature plummeted, sending chills racing down my spine. This was no ordinary summer evening. Jake was visibly sweating, struggling to maintain his composure. Mia kept scanning the room for logical reasons behind the chaos we were witnessing, but none made sense. That's when we heard it, a whisper, low and dragged out, as if someone was murmuring right in our ears without revealing themselves. The words were indistinct, yet they radiated a sinister tone that made our blood run cold. Panic set in as we decided it was time to leave, but the staircase now towered above us impossibly tall, as if the treehouse itself yearned to keep us inside. Shadows stretched further, the sun dipping lower behind the treetops, intensifying the oppressive atmosphere. At long last, we stumbled down the steps, but as we emerged, something felt dreadfully wrong. The forest was shrouded in shadows, the trees encroaching upon us, the path we took vanishing like a mirage. We tried to retrace our steps, but every direction led back to the treehouse. It was as though we were trapped in a maze, a loop spiraling us back into the jaws of that dread. Fear escalated into chaos when Mia broke down, tears streaming down her cheeks, a sight I had never witnessed before. Meanwhile, Jake fumbled with his phone, but it was dead, the screen only snow and static. It echoed with a muffled laughter that wasn't ours. Night fell entirely, and the treehouse transformed into a monstrous silhouette against the darkening sky. Its windows morphed into eyes, watching us with a hunger we couldn't comprehend. That swing kept rocking, its frantic rhythm a beckoning call, asking for someone to take a seat. Mia's gaze dropped to the ground. There lay a rusty coin, unlike any I'd seen before, an emblem of forgotten time. Did we miss this? She stammered, her voice shaky. None of us replied. Out of nowhere, we heard those heavy steps again. It was as though they were now inside the house. The wood creaked ominously, and I caught a glimpse of a long, thin shadow darting past the window. We bolted, but it didn't matter which way we ran. The treehouse remained a looming presence watching us with an unsettling stillness, as if we were pieces on a chessboard. Despair washed over us, and Jake blurted out that we should burn the place down. He ripped out his trusty lighter and flicked it to life, throwing flames onto the dry wooden entrance. In seconds, the fire licked eagerly at the walls, consuming them voraciously. It crackled and howled, as if mocking us, the whispers growing louder, rising with the flames. In our frenetic triumph, we thought we'd won. But the fire sputtered, promptly extinguished. The treehouse stood unharmed, untouched, as if it had never felt the searing heat of the blaze. And then we heard laughter, childish and piercing, mingling with the creak of that infernal swing gloom gathered once more. And a feeling of not being alone intensified Mia's face drained of color as she clutched the coin. It vanished from her palm like it had been snatched by an unseen force. As we attempted to sprint away, reality began to dissolve around us. The house, the whispers, the shadows, they all drew near again. Time stopped, each second dragging on, sinking us deeper into something incomprehensible. 
And as we stood there trapped in that nightmare, it became abundantly clear. This house was not merely a vessel of fear. It craved our very souls, determined to claim us forever. The sensation of being watched gnawed at us, a gnawing certainty that the dusk had transformed into something altogether more sinister. The treehouse seemed to shift positions encroaching upon us, each creak of the swing feeling like a hypnotic invitation. Surrounding us, the forest felt alive, shifting and moving, with trees whispering things we couldn't understand. After hours of fruitless wandering, we collapsed to the earth, a mere few feet from the treehouse, gasping for composure. Mia, the stalwart one of our trio, was drenched in tears now, murmuring incoherent prayers to gods beyond our knowledge. Jake, usually the comic relief, wore an expression of sheer dread, his gaze fixated on shadows yet to reveal themselves. I struggled to gather my thoughts, the air thick as if we were suffocating in a bed of despair. Darkness enveloped us, the stars swallowed by the overarching gloom. Just when I summoned the courage to rise, I noticed a carpet of coins surrounding us, identical to Mia's earlier find, arranged to form a sinister circle, like they had sprung from the ground in our absence. This is getting way too weird, I muttered, my voice almost lost to the breeze Jake picked one up, tossing it toward the treehouse. It struck the wooden wall with a sharp snap, and then the most peculiar event occurred. The swing halted, as did the whispers, leaving an oppressive quiet behind. But in that silence came a different sound, a dragging crash, and when I turned slowly, I was met with the figure that had once been a mere shadow by the window. Now it stood beside the house, tall and thin, with a face obscured by ragged fabric. Its eyes were empty voids, consuming any light that dared come near. It didn't move. It simply observed us, patient, as if waiting for our next move. Mia suddenly stood, drawn toward something we couldn't even see trance-like. She began walking towards it, her steps slow and deliberate. I yelled for her to stop, but my voice felt muted, unrecognized. Then I saw it. The coins on the ground twisted, forming unnatural shapes that felt ancient and foreign. Jake lunged to grab her, but was viciously hurled backward by a force I couldn't see. Mia paused inches from the figure, which lifted a skeletal hand, brushing lightly against her forehead. Time felt suspended. Her expression shifted to pure shock, then she collapsed, crumpling to the ground like a discarded toy. The thing turned its gaze towards Jake and me, beckoning us with a deliberate motion. Fear pinned me down, but that same whisper, different now, terrified, screamed for me to flee. Where? There was no escape. Jake crawled to Mia, desperate to revive her, but she was too cold, lips turning purplish, devoid of life. The figure disappeared, slipping back into the house's shadows, and with its retreat, the swing exploded back into menacing motion, clattering against decaying wood, accompanied by unsettling children's laughter, echoing from the depths of the structure. In a desperate act, we yanked Mia away from that cursed place, searching for sanctuary within the dense underbrush. But everything felt altered. Trees loomed closer, branches like grasping fingers, encircling us with malevolence. Jake tried to shake Mia awake, pleading with her to respond, but the only movement came from her fluttering eyelids, trapped somewhere beyond reach. All the while, I could hear coins falling again, a cacophony of metallic clinks. When I dared to glance backward, horror struck me. The masked figures had returned, no longer still, but advancing slowly, like a dark procession. The stench of decay heavy in the air, the whispers returned, a symphony of sound converging from all directions, taunting us. We struggled to pull Mia free, but it felt as though she was anchored down by unseeable tendrils. Suddenly, one of the coins glowed, flickering a blood-red light, pulsing like a heartbeat. This wasn't just imagery. This was a breach, a tether binding Mia to whatever cursed reality this was. Jake locked eyes with me, pure desperation mirrored in his expression. We knew we had to unravel this dark web. Whatever fate had shackled us to this entity needed to be severed. I grabbed a rock, scratching at the glowing symbol, 
but it simply passed through as though it didn't exist. Laughter echoed louder, a chilling, childish cacophony while the figures continued their slow crawl, synchronized in eerie choreography. In a move spurred by panic, Jake ignited a coin with his lighter, flames whooshing to life, trailing fiery light that consumed the symbols. Mia shrieked as if scalded, and for a fleeting moment I thought we had crossed a line we couldn't return from. But then, abruptly, the figures halted, the whispers muted into silence, while the masked silhouette gradually dissipated into the air. Mia awoke suddenly, gasping as if emerging from deep water. Jake held her tightly, an embrace of relief. But the tranquil moment shattered as we felt the presence still lingering. Something dark remained, hanging over us like a shadow, watching, waiting. We pushed ourselves to our feet, desperate for a route to safety, yet when we glanced back where the coins had shown, nothing remained but ash and scalded earth. We need to leave this place, Mia murmured, a plea filled with urgency. Deep inside, though, something warned me. What we thought we had vanquished was merely a superficial wound. The true terror dwelt in the depths concealed within the shadows lying in wait for the right time to strike again, and the eerie sensation that we were being followed refused to fade, not for an instant. As we traversed that bewitched terrain, each step felt heavier as if the ground conspired to root us in place. It was a warped reality. The trees shifted, the forest alive, ensnaring us in tangles of fear. Mia, ghostly pale, trembled uncontrollably, fixed on nothingness while Jake and I shared helpless glances that needed no words. The path appeared endless, the trees indistinguishable, their skeletal branches entwined like gnarled fingers. Slowly, a sound disrupted the eerie hush, dragging through the underbrush like chains I dared to pause, nerves alight with trepidation. This wasn't wildlife. Instead, it felt malign, something deliberate coming for us. I couldn't help turning around observing those ominous figures again, yet this time they stood perfectly still, integrated into the surrounding foliage like dark secrets encroaching upon us. Keep moving, I told Jake and Mia, my words barely a whisper as dread filled the air. The weight of being cornered settled in. Mia stumbled over a root, hitting the forest floor hard. Before we could assist her, one of those figures twitched, moving awkwardly as if manipulated by unseen strings reaching toward Mia. In that heartbeat, tension snapped. Jake and I pulled her back, and the figure vanished into the gloom. The sinister laughter echoed, swirling through the trees, now buzzing in our minds like an infectious chant. One by one, those masked figures began to dissolve into billowing smoke. But even in their absence, an insatiable presence remained. It was as if the forest itself breathed aware. Conscious miraculously, we stumbled upon a clearing, revealing a neglected well at the center, rough stones enveloped in a shroud of moss. An unsettling shiver coursed through me, the well pulsating faintly, almost like a heartbeat. Mia stepped forward, entranced by an invisible allure. Don't go near it, Jake shouted, but it was too late. She peered into the dark void of the well, her face paled, and before we could muster a single word, a pallid hand emerged, fingers long and gnarled, collaring her wrist with startling force Jake and I lunged, attempting to pry her free, but whatever dragged her was far too strong. Her cries echoed, filling the void with urgency, not just a well but a gateway to forsaken depths with everything we had, we yanked Mia back but the grip left a charred imprint burning into her skin. The forest shook, energized with a restless spirit while chains rattled ever closer. Those figures in their menacing forms advanced upon us, encircling us with relentless intent. Jake reached for his lighter once more, desperate to cling to hope. But as he flicked it on, a figure swiped it from his grasp with startling speed. The lighter tumbled into the well, igniting a dazzling orange flame illuminating the anguished faces trapped beneath, twisting mouths and vacant eyes crying silently for freedom. This wasn't just folklore, it was a grim reality. Those were the lost souls of children, trapped by outdated promises, each of their gazes piercing us for deliverance, yet filled with vengeful hunger. 
the earth beneath us crumbled, forest of life twisting in alarming ways. Entombing us in this nightmarish domain, Arthur caught sight of Mia, who dazedly began to utter something in a language that felt foreign and archaic. Those words seemingly ripped from her, infusing her with an irresistible pull towards the well. Jake seized her, willing her to stay grounded, but it felt futile against the forces at play. From the depths of the well, a towering figure began to materialize, hooded, formless, its aura suffused with an oppressive weight where light dare not dwell. Extending its hand toward us, a voice reverberated in our very beings, not audible but penetrating. We couldn't escape from its grasp. You have broken the pact now, a debt is due. The ground folded beneath, as darkness dragged at us like a malevolent tide. Jake and Mia's cries melded with the haunting giggles echoing through the oppressive gloom. Around us, the masked figures loomed ever closer, enveloping us until reality deafened into a frenzied blur of panic and despair. When I finally awoke, I found myself sprawled alone on the cold earth of the forest. The well lay unfilled and silent. The figures had vanished. The laughter felt distant. Shockingly, Mia and Jake were no longer by my side. I called for them, but only echoes returned, teasing me with the void where they should be. It was as if the path back home had finally revealed itself, a clarity that made no sense, guiding me away from the chaos that lingered. I returned to the town needing to spill my secrets, but nobody believed my tale. They claimed Mia and Jake simply disappeared. Searches through the wilds uncovered nothing but trees and silence, but I felt it. The truth gnawed at me. I knew they remained in a limbo of shadow. Intertwined with that deep-rooted darkness, I have never returned to that cursed sight. In the days that followed, a dark mark appeared on my own wrist, a crude reminder of that fateful encounter. And in my dreams each night, I still find myself confronted by the treehouse, the well, and those figures watching from afar, lurking, longing for their moment to seize me. Because there's one lesson learned in this, you never escape a pact without paying the toll and our price, it's still waiting to be collected. Still, 